work and, and uh, you know, we're gearing up doing Katrina anniversary stuff. And I just said to Ray, because I feel weird saying Mr. Nagin or Mr. Mayor. Ray is good. No, no. And so it's appropriate that here we are on three days away from the six year anniversary and we're here discussing your book. I'm glad you got it out in time. Um, it's also ironic, maybe some would say not so ironic, that now Hurricane 10 of the East Coast is also going to hit uh, New York City on Katrina Day, if, ish, and around that time. So keep your eyes on that as we continue to pray for those folks. Um, but Mr. Nagin, what I will say to you is, it has been an interesting uh, six years post Katrina, and it was the time that you were there, and during that time, you and the media had a love-hate relationship, I think it's safe to say. But after all this time later, I hear things like, um, thank you, people thank you for what you did. People say, no one could have known what would have happened and how to ha handle that situation, no matter who they were at that time. And uh, whether they love you or they like or they don't, um, they respect you for what happened during that time. So I have read your book. It's an interesting perspective, <laughs> and I hope you all have too. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say, and I'm curious to see what you have to say now, six years post Katrina, and where you think we are as a city and what your experiences have been. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome former Mayor Ray Nagin. And I'm, I'm going to stand over here if you guys don't mind, but... Let me just thank uh, Camille. Uh, last time I saw her, I called her, but out of her name, as another reporter. And she kind of looked at me with that look, like, you know you did wrong. So I appreciate that. And to Beverly and her staff for hosting this great event. Uh, I, I really uh, learned a lot the last time I was here. We were doing an interview for uh, the Tribune's uh, piece that they did on the book. Uh, so it's nice to be in the house of free people. Free people. And it's nice to see all you free people. You know, because I've never seen uh, the TP do a six-page spread on the book review. And that was a signal for people not to want to read this book. And for a period of time, they did. Uh, but now that we're, we're close to the anniversary, started to pick it up and start to read it. And, you know, I've been getting some very interesting feedback. Once you get past the time for the you know the blogs, you start to talk to real people, you get a sense. But Beverly wanted me to cover a couple of things with you. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I wrote the book. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book. And hopefully I'll explain to you, from my perspective, what we all went through. Because at the time we were going through Hurricane Katrina's aftermath, we all were struggling with a lot of different things. Uh, we were being positioned and pitted against each other. We had struggles, who knows how, how many we all had. We were trying to get the money to repair our homes. We had ran into a road home program that a federal judge recently ruled as being discriminatory. Uh, and there's a whole host of things. So my story, Katrina Secrets, Storms After the Storm, really started out as not a book. It started out as me just putting together my own personal library of my eight years after being in office. And, but once I got to the Katrina section of this book, uh, of this story, I was like, wow. And I had went through it, I lived it, uh, but I went through so much so fast that I really didn't appreciate the complexities of everything that I had gone through and everything that we had gone through. So I decided to start writing. Uh, I talked to some agents, I talked to some publishers, and at first they were like, yeah, we want to do something, but once you turn this manuscript over to us, it's ours, and we have control over the end product. You know me, I don't kind of like to be controlled. <laughs> so that didn't sit well. So I talked to some other agents from L.A. to New York. And I got a little bit of the same stuff. Uh, one wanted me to exaggerate certain things. Another one wanted me to play things down. One wanted me to be strong. One wanted me to be weak. You know, and after a period of time, I said, look, I'm not going through this. Uh, so I started researching self-publishing. 
and I ran across Amazon has a service called Create Space. And for those of you who are thinking about publishing a book, I recommend you take a look at it. Uh, you have to put up your own money, it's not a lot. They provide a suite of services that you can use, uh, from cover design, New Orleans and its history, to talk about it being one of the top slave trading ports uh, in, the, in, the country, in the south in the country. I talk about how we pretend a lot. We pretend like we all love each other, and we do for the most part, and there's no racial issues in the city. But when you look at the facts, there's a whole lot of stuff going on. So I take people through that because I wanted them to understand why they saw Katrina, why they saw the images, why they saw so much poverty, why, they, how do we get to this place? And a lot of it deals with institutional racism. And if I had to boil this book down and tell you in one sentence what it's all about, this is where a historic, catastrophic disaster violently collided with race, class, and politics. And that's what the story of Katrina's sequence is all about. So I take people through that. I take them through my childhood a little bit, and I explain to them exactly the struggles, the race wars that go on in this city almost on a daily basis that contributed to uh, what they saw during Hurricane Katrina. Then I try and deal with a lot of myths. Did we really evacuate properly? How many people did we get out? Most people don't know that we've got 95 to 96 percent of all the citizens of New Orleans out of harm's way before the storm hit. We had 4 percent left, and that's where the drama happened. But try and do that in another city. Look at what's happening on the East Coast right now. They are in trouble and don't really understand they're in trouble. That storm does not veer off and miss New York City. It's going to be a problem. Uh, but we got a lot of people out of harm's way. Then I take them through uh, how we dealt after the storm hit and once all hell broke through and how things started to unfold. And I tell the story about um, a president and a governor and a mayor who didn't quite get along. All right? And then you had a president and the governor really tussling over who would control all the resources that were coming into the ones, but more importantly, who would control the billions and billions of dollars for the recovery. And I'll never forget, I hadn't taken a shower in like five days or so. You know, I do this, I had to do this military bath. I don't know if any of you know this, but you know, when I had to take a shower in the hide, there was a bowl of water, soap, Wet up, lather up, take that same bowl of water, boom, and you're done. Did that for about five days. So I had a chance to go to a meeting on Air Force One. And you know, it's been documented. But the thing that I found most interesting is that the president and the governor were tussling over control, and the state was using a little known act, the federal law called the Posse Comitatus Act. If you ever get a chance, go check this out. The Posse Comitatus Act is a federal law that was passed during Reconstruction. And it was designed, the South had control of Congress. It was designed to impede or slow down the federal government uh, from enforcing the end of slavery. This thing is still on the books. And it basically says fundamentally a president cannot send federal troops in unless invited by a government, the southern government. So that wasn't happening. So they were fighting, and that's what held up the resources, for the most part, coming to our city. That tussle. And at the end of the day, the governor never really gave him the authority that he was looking for, nor did he really need it. So pressure built up on him so much that he ended up sending, up, sending in troops anyway without her approval. I also detail some of the things that happened around us, to us. Most people don't know that Jefferson Parish.